There are some things in life that we automatically establish as being facts because that's what we are told from childhood. I can almost guarantee that when you drew pictures of the sun as a preschooler, you always coloured it in either yellow, orange or red. And you've probably never thought about it again. You just accepted what you're told at a very young age as being a set in stone fact without ever reflecting on it. Everyone is guilty of this to an extent and it's not your fault. We have evolved to learn facts about life from our elders and parents and, for the most part, it works. But sometimes tradition and assumptions sneak their way in with the rest of the passed on knowledge. I've covered this topic before in an earlier video, but that left a lot of unanswered questions and probably caused a lot of confusion. And now that the goal of my explain series is to clear up confusion, I've decided to visit this topic again. What is colour? We take it for granted, but what actually is it at a fundamental level? It all begins with our star, the sun. The heat and pressure within the sun leads to something called nuclear fusion. Here, hydrogen nuclei are fused into heavier helium nuclei. This process releases photons, and those photons eventually reach the surface of the sun, where they proceed to escape into the vacuum of space, scattering in all directions. Some of these photons are extremely energetic, and have short wavelengths and high frequencies. Others are less energetic, and they have longer wavelengths and lower frequencies. You can think of frequency as vibrations per second of a wave. These photons bounce around and reflect off of most solid objects like rock and metal. They can also be scattered by gases and absorbed by solids to an extent. To really understand how light works and how we interpret light, we have to go back to the beginning. The first multicellular life forms on earth were simple things. Most were worm-like, marine animals, a simple tube with two holes at either end. It all started with trilobites. Initially these animals had no eyes. Photons were essentially useless to these creatures, aside from providing warmth. But this was fine, because no creature had eyes. Until one day, a random mutation led to a very strange sort of cell developing. A light-sensitive cell something that can react to photons hitting it. But this mutation didn't just die out, it persisted. Clearly there is some sort of advantage provided by them. As predators swam above these trilobites, they would block out sunlight and the cells would detect this change so they could swim away from the threat. So inevitably, as these trilobites lived to breed, the new feature stuck. Eventually these light sensitive cells began to form in clusters, concentrating themselves in a single location. We can see these simple eyes in creatures alive today, such as jellyfish. As a matter of fact, almost every single stage of the evolution of eyes is visible today, across the animal kingdom. The light sensitive cells then began to form in a concave shape, concentrating light further and producing a clearer and clearer image of the world. This pit evolved to be deeper and deeper, and eventually the light would be focused through a single pinhole, like a camera. The final step is the lens. The photons being focused on the light sensitive cells would then send electrical signals to the network of neurons we call a brain, which would decipher this information and produce what we now call sight. But only a small fraction of the photons emitted by the sun are actually seen. Gamma rays, for example, have wavelengths far too short for the light sensitive cells in our eyes to register. In fact, no life form can see gamma rays. X rays are also far too tiny and energetic to be resolved by any one cell. But ultraviolet is where some animals begin to detect light. But the sun mostly emits light in the infrared and visible spectrum 
But what actually is the visible light spectrum? We only call it that because it's visible to us humans. The visible light spectrum is actually a very small section of the spectrum, in between infrared and ultraviolet light. Its wavelength ranges from 400 to 750 nanometers. Some animals, like birds, can see far beyond this, into the ultraviolet side of the spectrum, whilst others are better suited to the opposite end of the visible spectrum, the infrared. At the end of the day, all colour is is just a slightly different wavelength of light. It's our brain's method of differentiating different wavelengths. So colour is just an illusion, and that means that you can have different colours of any light, which means that wavelengths we can't detect are probably just as colourful as visible light is to us. The red light we see is obviously closest to the infrared side of the spectrum, and blue and violet light is more energetic and closer to ultraviolet. For today's video, we're going to focus on our narrow slice of the light spectrum, visible light. Including other wavelengths is pointless because we can't detect them. The colour of the sun is not orange, or red, or yellow, if you haven't figured that out by now. All stars tend to emit light in all wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum to some extent. The intensity of each wavelength they put out is determined by their composition and temperature. The peak spectrum a star emits in is determined by its temperature. The coolest stars will be red in colour, and the hottest will be blue. This is true for any hot object. You can see this in metals, like iron with high melting points, where they'll start to glow white instead of red when reaching the melting point. But the temperature isn't the only factor. The star can absorb certain wavelengths more than others, based on its composition, as different atoms absorb different frequencies. For example, some red dwarf stars have a higher amount of carbon in them, which absorbs a lot of blue light. You can see here what the starlight spectrum would look like without this absorption, and what the spectrum actually looks like in reality, with dips throughout the different wavelengths. A red dwarf star will emit all wavelengths of light, just like our sun does, but it will peak somewhere closer to the red and infrared wavelengths. A blue star will also emit in all wavelengths, but will peak closer to the blue and ultraviolet wavelengths. So that brings us to the sun then. The sun peaks in the green wavelength, which makes it green, right? Wrong. Very wrong. The sun would peak in green if it were a perfect black body, which means it would essentially have to absorb 100% of light. But it isn't. The sun peaks in different wavelengths depending on what perspective you choose to take. In wavelength space, it peaks in violet light. In frequency space, it peaks in infrared. And if we assumed it was a perfect black body, it would peak in green. In reality, however, it emits all visible wavelengths pretty evenly, which means that it's almost perfectly balanced in the emission of red to violet light. If we evolved with a different star, our eyes would have evolved to see its colour combination as being perfectly balanced too. Remember, the sun and earth isn't made for us. We adapted to them. But let's avoid further complicating things. Everything will begin to make sense, and we'll come together now. I promise. The colour of the sun should have been given away without having to stare at it in space. Some dead giveaways are the colours of a rainbow, or the colour of snow. What are rainbows? Rainbows represent every colour in the visible light spectrum. They are a product of putting sunlight through a prism. So what happens when you put all these colours together? That's right, you get white light. Snow is essentially transparent. Snowflakes are made of frozen water, which is transparent in small quantities. So why snow white then? Well, you may have noticed this when storing a lot of ice in the same place, but that white light from the sun 
essentially gets scattered and reflected off of the snow, which is why ice and snow in large quantities looks white. Right then, so if the sun is white, how the hell did people get the idea of it being orange, yellow, or even red? As usual, our atmosphere is to blame for this. At noon, sunlight doesn't have much atmosphere to pass through, so scattering of sunlight is at a minimum. As the sun sets though, it has to travel through more atmosphere to reach your eyes. Our atmosphere absorbs more high energy low wavelength light, which means that some of the blue and violet light emitted by our sun is scattered and absorbed. Essentially sunlight comes in at a different angle. This will essentially make sunlight look more orange and red in colour, and the thicker the atmosphere the sun has to travel through, the redder it appears to get. And since you can only really look at the sun when it's rising or setting, that's how people got the idea that it must be orange or yellow. Well, now you know why it isn't. If it was, your eyes wouldn't have evolved to see blue light, plants wouldn't be green, and snow wouldn't be white. The missing blue light that gets scattered in our atmosphere is also very evident, as our atmosphere is blue, so that scattered blue light makes our sun look like a red dwarf star from Earth. Yep, that's right, red dwarf stars aren't actually red either, they would look yellow. But that's another story for a different time. Okay and that is the end of the video, thanks for watching and my next video will be something slightly different. I think I'll just let it be a surprise for now and don't forget to subscribe. You better subscribe.